Hello, and welcome to this video for Physics 132, wherein I will introduce the idea of the electric field, one of the key ideas for the rest of this course. For the past few units, we have been really focusing on the ideas of light. Now, everything we've been talking about in our units on geometric optics and physical optics applies to matter waves as well. We've just really been focusing on the applications to light. Now, here in Unit 4, we will return to electrons. And these will be the focus of our attention for the next two units. Up to now, we've been ignoring the fact that electrons have charge. And we know they do, so it's time to fix that. By thinking about the charge attribute of electrons, we will begin our study of the electric force. To begin, I want to remind you from 131 that there are fundamentally only four forces. The strong nuclear force, which is responsible for holding all of the positively charged protons in the nucleus together. The electrical and magnetic forces, which we will see through this course, are really two deeply connected sides of the same coin. And these are the ideas of opposite charges attract, like charges repel, and magnets. Again, while these may seem like wildly different phenomena at first glance, we'll see through this course that electricity and magnetism are deeply connected. Next in strength, we have the weak nuclear force responsible for radioactive decay. And then finally, the gravitational force, which holds you to the Earth and holds the Earth in orbit around the Sun. Gravity was talked about in some depth in Physics 131, whereas electricity and magnetism will consume our attention for the rest of 132. It's worth pointing out that the idea of opposite charges attract and like charges repel is the fundamental origin of all of the other forces taught in these courses. For example, in 131, you discuss the normal force. For example, when a physics book sits on a table, you have the weight of the book, sure, but you also have a normal force from the table on the book, which keeps it from falling through the table. This force is normal, i.e. perpendicular to the surface between the table and the book, and really arises because of the electrons in the table repelling the electrons in the book. Another force discussed in 131 is the idea of tension. For example, when a block is just hung by a string, you have the weight of the block being countered by the tension in the rope. Where does this tension ultimately come from? This tension comes from the atomic bonds, which are fundamentally electrical attraction, between one molecule of rope and the next. Similarly, springs. The spring force, Hooke's law, is a result of atomic bonds, so electrical at the microscopic scale. And finally, the frictional forces arise from van der Waals interactions between the molecules in different surfaces. Once again, you're talking about the electrical interactions between atoms. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain what a field is, explain how forces arise from objects interacting with fields, and justify the units of the electric field. Throughout this video, we will be using the force of gravity as a more familiar analog. You should perhaps rewatch the gravity and weight video from Physics 131 before watching this video to brush up on your skills. So before we begin with the electric field, we are going to explore everyone's favorite number from Physics 131, this 9.8 that was used extensively in that course. And we're going to sort of deconstruct exactly what this number is. Gravity is a bit form more familiar to us as we experience on a daily basis, and we will build up the idea of the electric field in parallel using gravity as a crutch. It is important, however, to keep in mind that gravity and electricity are fundamentally different forces. Absolutely everything in the universe experiences gravity. We saw in class through our gravitational redshift of light that even light experiences gravity. However, only those objects with charges will experience electrical forces. Can you perhaps think of something that experiences gravity but not electricity? You would need something that has mass but not an electric charge. So let's begin thinking about gravity. We know that the force of gravity is what holds the moon in orbit around the Earth. But how does the moon know that the Earth is there? I mean, the moon is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters away from the Earth. 
something. That's a long way. How does the moon know that the Earth is even there? To simplify and bring it a little more down to Earth, no pun intended, we're going to think about a ball. We all know that when I release a ball, it falls due to the Earth's gravity. We could ask the same question. How does the ball know that the Earth is there? They're not in contact. Yes, the distances are a lot smaller, but they don't touch each other. How does the ball know that the Earth is there? The way that this is explained is that the Earth generates a gravitational field. And this gravitational field is what the letter G from Physics 131 represents. And the strength of that gravitational field is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Now you might be used to thinking about it being meters per second squared, but if you look a little bit at Newton's second law, F equals ma, you will see that meters per second squared and newtons per kilogram are equivalent units. So we're going to think in terms of newtons per kilogram because it's a more useful uh, unit for our purposes right now. So the Earth generates this gravitational field and it points straight down and it has a magnitude of 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Now you will notice that the ball does actually touch the Earth's gravitational field. It doesn't touch the Earth, but it does touch this gravitational field. And through this contact, the ball reacts to that field by feeling a gravitational force, mg. So the force is the mass of the ball, m, times the strength of the gravitational field, g. And that's what gives rise to the force. Now let's return to these units for g, these newtons per kilogram, that you might not be used to thinking about. For every one kilogram of ball, the ball feels 9.8 newtons of force. That's what mg means. A two kilogram ball will feel two times 9.8 newtons of force. So that's why these units are somewhat useful for our purposes right now, is it tells us how many newtons of force we get for each kilogram of ball. That's what 9.8 represents. So why did we introduce this middle step of a, of a gravitational field that's invisible and extends from the Earth? Why did we invent this? Why can't we just say that something causes the ball to fall and the magnitude of the force is mg? That's what we did in 131. Well, the reason we invent this is because this field, while we cannot see it, is a fundamentally real object. It's just as real as a ball. Yeah, it's invisible, but so are atoms, and you know, you, you believe atoms are real. So the field is a similar thing. It is fundamentally a real quantity. It contains energy. In fact, we can think about the energy when we let the ball go. When the ball falls, it gains kinetic energy. Where does that energy come from? That energy comes from the gravitational field. So this is a fundamentally different way of thinking about and thinking a little more deeply about what gravity actually is and where this 9.8 newtons per kilogram number comes from. So that's gravity. Now let's return to the idea of electricity, the main focus of our course. How does the electron know the nucleus is there? We know that it's the positively charged nucleus attracting the negatively charged electron that holds the atom together. But again, the nucleus and the electron do not touch. So how does the nucleus know that the electron is there? I'm going to add a proton to this situation for purposes of illustration, but the same argument could be made. How does this stray proton know that the nucleus is there? Well, we use the same sort of idea. The nucleus generates an electric field that we call E. And then the other charges, this electron and stray proton, respond to that field by feeling a force. So the force felt by the electron is QE. And with analogy to gravity, where the force was the mass times the gravitational field, the force felt by these other charges is going to be the charge 
times the electric field. So the stray proton feels a force QE, where Q is the positive charge of proton. And similarly, the electron also feels a force QE, where now this Q is the charge of the electron. Now it's worth noting that this expression gets the sign correct. In the case of the proton, the charge is positive and the force and the electric field are in the same direction. For the electron, the charge is negative, and so the force and the electric field are in opposite directions. The force is inward and the electric field is outwards. So it's important to keep in mind that this expression actually does get the signs correct. In fact, so does our expression for gravity. Mass is always positive, and so the force of gravity is always in the same direction as the gravitational field. Once I know the forces, I can then go on to calculate accelerations using Newton's second law. So let's do some examples. We'll do an example with gravity first, and then do one with electricity. So let's say we have a five kilogram object with a charge of two coulombs, and it's sitting above the surface of the moon, where G is 1.6 newtons per kilogram. Different planetary body, different gravitational field. What is the acceleration of this ob five kilogram object? Well, we begin by thinking about what force is acting, the weight force. We know that the weight force is the mass of the object times the gravitational field. In this case, five kilograms times the 1.6 newtons per kilogram, giving us a weight force of eight newtons. Then we can move on to calculating the acceleration using Newton's second law, F equals ma. The only force here is weight, the eight newtons. We know the mass of the ball, five kilograms, and we are left with the acceleration of 1.6 meters per second squared. Just as you might expect from 131, the acceleration and g are the same number. This results from the fact that both in the definition of the weight force and the definition of Newton's second law are both dependent upon the mass of the object. Let's go to electricity to see a case where it's not always dependent upon mass. So let's have the same five kilogram object with two coulombs of charge. Only this time it's sitting in an electric field of 20 newtons per coulomb instead of a gravitational field of 1.6 newtons per kilogram. What is the acceleration in this case? Well, the force at a play is now the electrical force, which is going to be the electric charge times the electric field. We know the charge is two coulombs, we know the electric field is 20 newtons per coulomb, giving us an electric force of 40 newtons. Now we move into calculating the acceleration. F equals ma. Our force is 40 newtons, the electric force we just calculated. Our mass is 5 kilograms, and so we get an acceleration of 8 meters per second squared. You'll notice that in this case, Q and M are not are different, right? We have a five kilogram object with two coulombs of charge. The charge is what's relevant for calculating the electric force. The mass is what's relevant for calculating the acceleration. And since these are different, the acceleration and the electric field are not the same number. So this idea where the acceleration and the gravitational field are the same number is kind of unique to gravity because both the force and Newton's second law depend upon m. This uniqueness and thinking about it deeply is what actually led Einstein to developing the general theory of relativity. So how to be successful for the rest of this course? The people who will be successful for the rest of this course will begin to really think about the fields as being real objects. These fields, gravitational fields, electric fields, magnetic fields are truly present and they are everywhere around us. 
and I want you to work on visualizing these fields and thinking of interactions in terms of them. So, for example, when you push on a wall, what's really going on there? Well, if we zoom in quite a lot, what's really going on is the charges in your finger and the charges in your wall are both generating electric fields. And these electric fields inner cause the charges to repel. So the charge in your finger generates an electric field. The charge in the wall interacts with that field and is repelled. And that's the, the origin of your sensation of pushing against a wall, is through this intermediary of the electric field. In summary, both gravity and electricity are fundamental forces that can act without contact between the objects. So how is this force actually transmitted if there's no contact? The answer is through fields. All massive objects generate gravitational fields, G, and all electrically charged objects generate electric fields, E. A distant object can interact with these fields and feel a force. An object with mass, M, in a gravitational field, G, feels a force, Mg mass times the field. And F is always in the same direction as G because mass is always positive. And the units of G, are, we're now going to think of them as newtons per kilogram. Similarly, an object with charge Q in an electric field E feels an electric force charge times electric field. These parallels are what cause people to sometimes call mass gravitational charge because mass is playing the same role for gravity as charge does for electricity. So any object with charge in an electric field feels an electric force, QE, and this electric force can be in the same direction or opposite direction as the field. Unlike gravity, the force can be opposite the field because charge can be positive or negative. And just like the units of gravitational field are newtons per kilogram, the units of electric field are newtons per coulomb. This concludes this video.